Loving Father, we thank you for the men that have come out tonight and for the time that we're going to spend here together. We ask that you open our hearts, our minds, and our thoughts through this study of Zephaniah so that we can learn more about you and your nature and your love and your discipline. And Lord, this study tonight has a lot of that, but uh, we do need to look at you from as balanced a position as we can. And we pray that you will touch each heart tonight and you will put something in each person's heart that they need to hear for themselves tonight. And I pray that they will be aware of your presence during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to very quickly review Zephaniah 1 since I had all those notes I don't want to totally waste. But uh, in that, and I understand it was covered very well in my absence, and I appreciate that. And the first chapter is really almost entirely about the warning, or we could even call it a promise of a coming judgment. It's written by Zephaniah, whose name means God hides, or God is hidden. And I find that to be a beautiful paradox, that Zephaniah is, is now promising that God's not going to be hiding anymore. He's there, and showing up. And he is likely the last minor prophet writing before the Babylonian exile. So the entire chapter after the preface, which proclaims this book as the work of God coming through Zephaniah, is the promise of judgment and an outline of the different facets of the sin that has infested Israel and Judah. And the first and most critical of those is idolatry. And that is, you know, he's, he's prophesying the judgment of every Baal worshiper. And idolatrous and pagan priests will be punished. Princes and kings are mentioned. And foreigners that are violent and deceitful. So not all of them are violent and deceitful ones. And from there, we talk about, he talks about the merchants and those that are complacent, which is one of those things that sort of strikes home with me. Those are included in the judgment. If you're not doing what you need to be doing and you're just letting things slide and then you are one of the ones being judged during this time and still I imagine all right the last five verses describe both the intensity of the judgment where mighty men will cry out and it also looks at the certainty of the wrath and destruction if the complacency continues and if they continue down that slope. And the indication really is here that no one will escape judgment, at least in that first part. No silver or gold can preserve them. They'll be blinded because of their sin against God. So with that, all that cheery information we get to launch into chapter two and before we read it does anyone remember who was king of judah at this time josiah, uh, josiah. <clears throat> yeah. now another note zephaniah was unusual as a prophet because he came from the royal lineage he's the great great grandson of king hezekiah was Hezekiah, I mean, excuse me, Zephaniah was a relative of Hezekiah, who was a king, his great great grandfather. You remember whether Hezekiah was a good king or a bad king? Good king. He was a good king. And what happened when Hezekiah was king? Um, there was the siege of Jerusalem because he's the one that built the water wall. I don't remember who was 
besieging the city, though. Fellows, and it was the Assyrians, with, and this was their rise, and they were becoming really dominant in that entire area. That's the record of Ramshika, isn't it? Very nice. I think that's right. right. And wiped out a bunch. I'm not that good. I don't remember this. That's all to say. She's the one in the yeah. What did Hezekiah do? I mean, he did build a tunnel, but what really accomplished the turning back to God for that? It was a major part of what he did when he was destroying idols. He was destroying idols. So, what kind of king is Josiah? <laughs> the, first, the first 10 years, he is very young and he's sort of going through the flow. And that's probably the period that this is being written. So we don't really know yet, based on Zephaniah's writings. But he turns out to be another one of Judah's good kings. So knowing that, and that he's an idol smasher, do we look at things that... Now, do we look at this situation and things, think things may turn out okay? Exactly. Try to find a little bit of optimism there. <laughs> but yeah, and then we'll see as we go through this study what happens. But let's go ahead and read, starting in verse 1 of chapter 2. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together. O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued. For the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld His justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. And that's one through three. So what do we see in these verses? Like last week, I'm going to let you guys do the work. Mm -hmm. You pretend I'm not here. Mm -hmm. Cause your repentance. Cause your repentance. The call of repentance. Something that we didn't really see in the first chapter, or I didn't, is in the last few verses there. What is, what is possible at this point? To be hidden in the Lord's anger. It, it, it is the repentance. I mean, that, I, reading chapter 1, it seemed all pretty hope, hopeless to me. I don't know if you got the same impression. But these first three verses are showing that, yeah, you're messing up, you're undesirable. I found that to be an interesting way to describe God's people in that point. Come off good words. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm sure many of us uh, resemble that at times. But he's uh, saying that we do have the opportunity if we are what? If you do what things? Seek Seek righteousness. Think that, and we'll see different things there as most important. But to me, it was seek humility. Because that, throughout this chapter, we're going to see uh, pride is uh, something that really is a problem. And humility is the flip side of that. One of the other things that wasn't mentioned was gathering together. That was one of the first things in the verses. There's a call for a unity and not <coughs> individual repentance, but corporate repentance. It has to be all the people. And before the decree, there is a chance for repentance. Otherwise, they're going to experience the Lord's anger. There's also an implication here that there are some just, meek, good folks still in Judah. And that is also sort of a sense of hope there. But the good suffer with the 
evil when the judgment comes, because they'll be part of that. All right, uh, reading 4 to 7. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon desolate. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Cherethites. Cherethites, probably. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you, so there shall be no inhabitant. The seacoast shall be pastures with shelter for shepherds and folds for flocks. The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed their flocks there in the houses of Ashkelon. They shall lie down at evening. For the Lord their God will intervene for them and return the captives. Okay. That's weird. Sorry. Uh, the next verses are addressing the nations around Judah. They're showing that the judgment is going to extend beyond God's people toward many nations. And these verses refer to the Philistines. And that is one of the peskiest groups. I mean, if you remember many chapters before, these are the guys that are the biggest thorn in their side. And part of that is, well, they're there because they were cleared out as God required when the tribes first came into the land. But they have a higher technology and more warriors. And we know plenty of the stories from that. So the Philistines being wiped out here is God taking care of what the Israelites should have already. And they are the most dangerous of Judah's immediate neighbors. More hope is seen in these verses. The coast is going to be for the remnant of Judah. Now, remnant isn't as hopeful, but you know that the people will survive because of that. But individuals may be in trouble during that time. And it's also part of the curse because many Judeans will be lost. That's kind of obvious from the, being the remnant. And they're going to be captured during this time. Anybody say anything else in those verses that I'd like to bring up? That's through seven. Okay, let's read on. 8 through 11. I have heard the, repro the reproach of Moab and the insults of the people of Ammon, with which they have reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be like Sodom and the people of Ammon like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall plunder them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. This they shall have for their pride, because they have reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome to them, for he will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. People shall worship him, each one from his place. Indeed, all the shores of the nations. All right, what do we see happening here? <clears throat> Judgment on Moab and And unlike Israel, what's going to happen with them? Well, Israel, Judah. Their destruction is permanent. Yes. Pastor Jim, you had said what we see in this previous set. I didn't get my hand up fast enough. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, 
It said here in 6, I think it's 6, and this one is 6. The sea coast will become pastures with meadows for shepherds and bowls for flocks set on the coast of the land of the remnant of the house of Judah. And so this is Philistia. Yes. I mean, and this would be present day Gaza Strip. And so in history, did they ever, did, has this been fulfilled yet? In history, that like up into the coast, it would be called Israel. It was then, okay. But God, in His economy of words, uses the same. I mean, that was a prediction of what would happen then, and has happened again, and will happen again. And it sounds like it may be happening almost as we speak. But it is. Israel's place to take that land because at this point you know, that is what God has promised to them. And what He's promised to them they don't have nearly all of at this point. They, someday that will happen again and may not be until He returns. But, yeah, I think we can always look at things and should look at things that happened then and see how that applies to what's happening. It may be, I was saying it may be sort of like I've heard something about this concept of telescoping like with prophecy that it's like it's got a then meaning when it was proclaimed but then it's got future ramifications because prophecy is kind of like you know kind of different than the other genres but it's like a, and I just wonder um, and it's a living thing yeah. uh, this is going to happen and it happens okay let's go to the next thing that's right. the ceremony. It's like it can be. For, for lack of a better word, I've described it as like a different kind of animal, but it's, that's not the right way to say it. But it's almost like the words, because they're from God, it's consistent with His character, and His character doesn't change. So if it's got this like far-reaching meanings that may, it doesn't change, but the response of God's people, obedience or disobedience, may affect their enjoyment of or entering into those works that are going to happen either way, you know. And that's the bigger thing to look at than the, I mean, it's nice to see the particulars because that shows us his word is true, but it's the obedience, it's the humility that brings us to where God wants us to be, both personally and corporately. And it's the idolatry, the disobedience, the arrogance of doing things your own way that takes us far away from him and brings judgment. So the, the big picture is this is a recurring thing and we pick on the Israelites sometimes for, didn't they get it? They had all these signs, but we don't get it either. So it's a, it's a warning for all of us. All right. We do have the permanent removal of Moab and Ammonite and the Ammonites here. And why do they why have they gotten God's attention? What are they doing? First of all, he's challenging God's people. Yeah. And and basically it, it doesn't even really say they're doing anything active against them. They're just <clears throat> going insults. Picking on, disrespecting, and that's enough. So we do want to be careful in how we treat God's people because the Israelites are still there or back there, I guess. Is the way to put it. And uh, many Christians, sadly, are very anesthetic. I thank God we're not that way here. But you will run into Christians, and they may be great Christians. One that comes to mind to me is Jimmy Carter. He's done a lot of wonderful things, and he's a firm believer. But he's very opposed to Israel, and that to me is very sad. In no ways to take away, because that's a serious concept that we should not. But I think it, it almost... It holds true the same for each other in the body of Christ. 
Like we shouldn't speak against the Jewish people, but really we well, shouldn't speak against each other. You know, because I mean, but not to in any way, because yes, that's a prevalent issue, particularly for Jews. What one of the things, and this is, I guess, a rabbit trail, but it's important. One of the most important things is not ju judging our brothers, our brethren. <laughs> We need to, our brethren and our sisters, that's a, sister. we, we want to give grace to everyone. Now, and that, so, this phrase I, I, I love, but it's sometimes abused, because, well, we need to do this in love. Um, and we say that to let us be mean sometimes, rather than do things in love. But when we see someone that is in error or is struggling with something <laughs> and our place is, isn't to, well, you know, let's be nice and, and maybe they'll get over it. I mean, it is God's place to correct that sin, but a loving thing to do is to point it out and say, you know, here's a place that I see you struggling. And when someone does it for us, we need to be thankful for it, not defensive or angry. Uh, that's tough, but we are meant to be in community and meant to support each other. And that was actually, is getting back to part of what was going on here, because it was gathered together. And we need to support each other, but not to judge each other. All right, we're, uh, one of the things that you may or may not be aware of, but who are the Moabites and Ammonites? You might know what they're people of Jordan. They are, but do you know what their ancestry is? Lot. Lot. Yeah. The, these are the offspring of Lot having sex with his daughters. So it's it's kind of a very fitting comparison that they're going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah because they were born out of sexual sin and that was what got Sodom and Gomorrah this way. A lot of problems. They had a lot of problems. Yes. <laughs> there aren't many people that have worse puns than they even think and pop in or two of them. Anybody notice the word awesome here? Anybody think, oh yeah, that's great. I mean, I, this sounds like the true meaning of awesome. They are in awe of what God is doing. And I think we kind of abuse and misuse that word these days because, oh, gee, that's a red chair. That's awesome. Well, you know, that may be God's awe that has brought us to have red chairs, but it is something that just my thing about I don't think that's a word to use lightly because you lose the true meaning of what awe is. And they are in awe of God here. And that's a, a fearful place. <coughs> God will always glorify himself by destroying idols. And that's what's happening here. And he's reducing idolatrous nations to nothing. They basically are only pursuing vanity and they're outside of God's will, they're outside of God's protection, which leads to destruction. And that still applies today. So, any comments or questions on that section before we dive on and go to Ethiopia? All right, let's read on. You Ethiopians also, you shall be slain by my sword. And he will stretch out his hand against the north, destroy Assyria, and make Nineveh a desolation, as dry as the wilderness. The herd shall lie down in her midst, every beast of the nation, both the pelican and the bittern shall lodge on the capitals of her pillars. Their voices shall sing in the windows, desolation shall be at the threshold. 
for he will lay bare the cedar work. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt securely. They said in her heart, I am it, and there is none besides me. How has she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down? Everyone who passes by her shall hiss and shake his fist. All right. What do you guys see happening here? Continued judgment. Continued and expanding. The consequences of God's judgment are very far reaching. Anybody want to guess how far Ethiopia is from Jerusalem? I was actually surprised when I looked it up. Probably about. It was about triple what I thought it was. I would have guessed about 500 miles. That's exactly what I guessed. It's 1,500 miles. They <laughs> are a long way away. I find that somewhat reassuring that we picked the same number. <laughs> I almost wrote it down without looking it up. I said, no, nah, it could be off by a couple hundred. But it, it blew me away that it was 1,500 miles. And Assyria, that is the power that has been ruling for over a hundred years. They are the most powerful nation in the world at that point. God stretched out his hand against the north. God completes the judgment of Assyria and the capital city of Nineveh within 25 years of this writing, and it was probably more like 18 to 20 years. So a very short period of time historically this comes true. The fall of the Assyria to the Medo-Persians was rapid and complete. They were decimated. And part of that was the Assyrians were proud and arrogant, they were rejoiced. They were the rejoicing city that dwelt securely, but their security was in their own strength, and their own strength was taken from them. God brought them low through their pride. And Zephaniah doesn't mention the reasons for God's judgment on these neighbors, but if you're interested, Amos, Isaiah, and Nahum all give details sins in those countries at that time. Alright, that's all my talking, so from here on out I just have a few questions. If those aren't enough, I'll we'll make up a few more. What was the difference in Nineveh and Jonah's time, which was about 760 BC, and Zephaniah's time 150 years later? First, what happened in Jonah's time? They, they repented as they said he had his warning. They repented. Mm -hmm. In a very unheartfelt, impassionate, well, he was passionate, but he was against them. A preacher that came to town and told them to repent or they'd be destroyed. And they heard it and believed and, and did. What's happening here 150 years later? going to destroy them out of hand. There's no more warning. And they're secure in their own strength. I think they are. That's actually something I've always want to challenge. People are confident and feel secure because usually that's in your own tap, the God-given talents that you have, and that sort of thing. But those can always change, and will if we become like the Ninevites. Think, you know, we don't need God; we got all we need here. It doesn't work out. What was the outcome of the warnings of coming judgment on Judah? 
what was King Josiah's response. You will have to run ahead a little bit to figure that out. Does anybody know? It is sort of implied in some of the things that said would be worry this prophecy that would be happening. Okay. King Josiah did, a, and you said it earlier, did as Hezekiah did. He destroyed the idols. And like at the time of Hezekiah, it was a rough time. Uh, but their remnant did survive there, and that was largely due to the, be the obedience at that time. All right, how do, how do we apply what we learned about these ancient tribes and what they did? How can we see that and what's going on in our world now? This one's wide open, so I expect you to run with it. Otherwise, we're getting out early. Seek see the Lord first, you don't need the warning. <laughs> Do we see warnings today? Not prophetic like this, no. Or at least I don't. I think some of the not having the prophets is having the Holy Spirit. We do have prophets out there. If you see them and want to listen to them. I forget the name of the rather exciting uh, Messianic Jewish fellow. Gosh, is that a car? Yes. And some of what he's said would happen has been prophetic in the past. And the, him showing that, you know, these things are happening, and it is, and bad things happen related to the treatment of Israel. But we don't look for those connections like I think we should sometimes. Or we, as I prone to do, right? Oh, well, that could be a coincidence. I don't, I don't think God has a lot of coincidences. He, there is cause and effect at levels we don't see. So, what else do you get out of what happened then that you can apply to what's happening now? I might turn this over to you here shortly. <laughs> talk about it. I think you always learn, I mean, you know, you talk about you know, prophecy, but I mean, you know, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, I think is all sufficient. But I think by implication, we can see these behaviors. I mean, Kind of the obvious, you know, you're gonna have the reap and sow effect, the boomerang effect. I mean, you know, you can sit there and insult God's people, expect them not to be any kind of I mean, you know, this is sort of like the day to day application, but also you need to obviously draw that connection on a broader scale and uh, look at other nations that obviously, you know, depending on where, how close they're connected with. You know, honoring God's word, God's people, you know, you know, people of Israel, Christians as a whole, you know, how they honor God's word or not, that uh, by implication you can receive from God's word and God's Holy Spirit, and you have to you know, saying, this is it, this is that, and you know, like, oh, dude, something's going to happen. It's <laughs> kind of keep going on and going on and on and on. And on. I mean, my first 150 year, 200 year, a long season like these, you know, there's obviously different groups that are mentioned in here. But even, you know, part of the thought when you talk about Hezekiah and you talk about 
We talked about Josiah, even in their own lives, you know, not having, uh, like Josiah, we got, we got this, just this wild hair that we're in, thinking he's going to take on this, this, the <laughs> Egyptian king and gets bopped, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe he had a good run, you know, he was like, man, the Lord's using me. So they're smashing idols. So take out the Egyptians. You know, no humility, perhaps. No <clears throat> and, and no <laughs> asking God if that was the thing to do. Sure, he has a guy. I mean, he got his book. And, and, and that didn't work out too well. Yeah, so I mean, even good, godly people that we notate from the scripture, quote unquote, good kings, quote unquote, you could say good Christian, <laughs> you know, have our uh, those propensities to. Uh, Stepping in it, you know, so to speak. Stepping out of sin, step outside of these, you know, good things that the Lord talks about here. You know, the thing you alluded to in chapter two, the first few verses there. Be meek, seeking the Lord, seeking righteous, seeking humility. The thing that I thought personally that I looked at that was upheld is justice. I think that's something that's kind of connects to what you were saying also. Um, in terms of um, correcting perhaps another believer and not just, you know, eh, whatever. And, and one of the things that is a problem that gets judged is complacency. Yep, the first chapter, yeah. So we don't, you know, want to get into the, well, God will take care of that. Well, He will, but if He wants to use you to do it and you're not even asking, He'll find somebody else that but you will miss out on blessing at the very least, and you may be judged harshly because of the missed opportunities. It's the sin of omission, perhaps. Yeah. He, he loves us, and he's going to use everything for our good and for his glory. Right. But that doesn't mean you know, we're going to win the lottery or you know, our children are all going to grow up to be perfect saints. The things that we think that being obedient are going to yield are rarely the things that God wants to give us or wants to take us through to, to learn more about His nature, His character, and His love. It, it is, I mean, I used to read, avoid the Old Testament, and when I did read it, I'd get scared because I would see God his righteousness uh, bringing judgment to sinners. And even when I wasn't following him, I knew I was a sinner. So it really, I, I would stick with the, you know, the loving passages of the New Testament. And we see the same judgment of God there. But it's a little wilder in the context of God laying down his life for us, but it's still there. God is always righteous. That's why we needed a Savior. And totally aside, but it requires a blood sacrifice to atone for our sins. Who did the first Animal sacrifice in the Bible. God. Uh, God. I mean, I mean, I mean, I a, well, I mean, it, it had to be a bloody sacrifice because you don't skin an animal without <laughs> And he, he provided skins for Adam and Eve to wear. So there was a blood sacrifice from their original sin. And you know, we look at Cain and Abel. Who had the righteous sacrifice? And you, somebody else might have heard this teaching today, and it was kind of funny, but it was also true. You, know, you can't get blood from a turnip. The giving the now later Moses writes down the grain offerings, and that's okay, but that wasn't the case early on. All right. Last question. How did God, and I 
hopefully each one of you will have a response to this. We might let you off the hook since you were late, but you can still have picked up something for the time you've been here. How did God speak to you through what we read tonight? What did, what's something God laid on your heart during our discussion the reading? I'm glad I live in the house kind of thing. Amen to that. Being prideful on most of them. Not today. <laughs> Boy, pride on most of them. That's a good one. Seeking more humility in my life. Almost. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of how humble I am. <laughs> Seeking humility is pretty much challenge all of your decisions. God, give me humility and give it to me right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Works for that as well as patience. Like I was having a day last week where everything was getting delayed and Margaret was just, oh, I'm so sorry this is happening. I said, well, God's Give me a little patience lesson today. It's okay. And, uh, he does that, but that's what we need to look for. When things aren't going the way we want them to go, it doesn't mean that God's not working with us. It probably means He is. And He's trying to draw us to Himself. Who else picked up something tonight? If you didn't get anything out of this, I'm not going to teach you anymore. I, mean, I, I don't come and you do great. Um, <laughs> corporate repentance. Corporate yeah, repentance. Yeah, is, so. We have to do it not only individually, but as a body. That's a very good one. There's two or three verses I've ever written on. The, the thing that he's telling them to do, like the only remedy, the only way of escape, basically, is in those first couple of verses there in chapter, or chapter two, two or three. So I get something to call me on. One of the things I did pick up on is that. I mean, the first chapter, I'm almost glad I wasn't here because that was depressing when I was studying the three. But the first real hope showed up at the beginning of chapter 2. And then we kept seeing little pieces of it. You know, the remnant will inhabit this area. And these, will, this will be their territory. So we knew they were going to suffer through this time. And it got worse when they got carted off to Babylon a little bit later. But that was after further sin after their momentary spike up during this period. But God never deserted them in the worst of times. He was there. Alright. Repentance, repentance, repentance gives you uh, a chance for or hope for uh, being saved from God's wrath. Uh, lack of repentance assures you you go on face right. I hate the word wrath. I go with judgment, but that can be pretty wrathful. <laughs> and you're right. In a lot of ways, it's God's. I mean, you know, you know, you know, obviously, you see these different time periods of Revelation 6 to 19. There's a lot of essentially God's wrath. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it, you know, in, in some ways, it's God's mercy for people to allow people to reap what they have sown on earth in hopes that they might repent toward heaven. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, you think you're doing something, I mean, you know, that's why I pray. I mean, you know, you pray for situations where we see, you know, obviously, you know, see the wicked prosper, you know, obviously in the season. You know, you kind of pray that they see the end of that. Now, but they don't see the end of that now, and they carry that over into eternity. I mean, they're just obliterated, and 
not just in a practical sense on earth, but forever. Apart from that. And that's a scary thought. And we need to hold on to that scary thought if we care anything about anybody. And we are not assured of other people's salvation. And you gotta, you gotta ask. And love them and care. And one of the, it's, it was a weird encounter, but Almost sounds like the game of Joe, but on board ship, I talked to two Scottish guys that were fairly well inebriated about God. And they wanted to talk about conspiracy, or one of them, talk about conspiracy theories, and the other one would be to tell him about as stupid as brother in law was. But as often as I, I pray for people, and they're on my heart. But that was almost a year ago, and that is still one of my primary prayer targets for those two guys. And I'm only sure of one of their names. It's James, and I think the other one was John, and I like the symmetry of that, so I'm calling him John, even if somebody else got those. But they're taxi drivers in Edinburgh, and part of their one of them in particular, the rejection of God, was having Christians riding in a taxi on more than one occasion and, you know, beat them over the head with the Bible. Say, like, you don't repent, you're going to go to hell. And, you know, especially as Scots, you don't tell us what we have to do because we're going to rebel. So, so that's, that's human nature, but it's particularly brought in that on folks and God has them on my heart and I'm hoping someday I'll see them again but why those two and why not my wife's best friend for 40 years because God's got her on Carolyn's heart we're all going to have different people that we are put in a place to minister to have to A, be listening, and then be obedient and reaching out to others. And if you don't have, know how, talk to me. I've never seen anybody that does a better one-on-one -on -one than telling people about Jesus. But God equips all of us in whatever situation we're in. All right. That seems like a pretty good place to stop you. Oh. I didn't know I'd been walking this hour, but I just got some solid stuffing, so yay. Let us pray. Loving Father, let us never forget your holiness. And that there is judgment for all of us, but that the final judgment death that is awaiting some that we have been saved from because of the gift of the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, let us never hesitate to share that with anyone we meet. And not react as most of us have a tendency to fear of embarrassment and fear of what they may think. But let us also let us always look at being in fear and in awe of you and what you can do with us if we're willing to step out. And thank you for this teaching and learning that you are always ready for us to repent. But if we are not willing, then we will face judgment wrath, correction at some level. And Lord, we do know that nothing we do can separate us from your love. Nothing we do can make you love us more. But our show of love for you comes in being 
obedient and being present and looking to hear from you in all things. And we'll never get that totally right. But may we constantly be improving in the pursuit of righteousness. We pray this in the name of the righteous one, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs>